Welcome to Todd and Eve's show, where I try to unpack the mental models of interesting people and learn in public. And this week, we have Courtney Kelly from Strength Ratio on the podcast. And Courtney has a background in linguistics, which is super, super interesting stuff. We kind of break down some theories from linguistics that she applied to exercise and coaching and training in an article that she wrote for Strength Ratio, which we'll link to in the show notes. And there's a lot of really good ideas there about trade-offs and understanding how language is constructed that's applicable pretty much to any any complex system and certainly training and coaching is is one extremely complex system and Courtney is also a copywriter she has a copywriting company she's just launching called Ethos Alchemy so we talk about applying some of the concepts from linguistics and trade-offs and all that kind of stuff to copywriting as well so check this one out So as a fitness coach, you know, I'm someone who has a background in chemical engineering and that sometimes surprises people because it's like, well, why are you uh, hanging out in a gym with a bunch of stupid meatheads when you could be, I don't know, balancing the pressure in a reactor somewhere. And so I always appreciate it when people involved in fitness have backgrounds or interests that are seemingly disparate or overly academic in nature and all that kind of stuff. So for you, you have a background in psycholinguistics, right? Um, And recently wrote an article that takes some concepts from psycholinguistics and then an attempts to apply them to fitness. And I thought it was really, really interesting. So for folks who are like, what is psycholinguistics? Is this like being, I don't know, um, some sort of a psychosocial slipknot fan? Like, what are we talking about? Here? <laughs> yeah. Um, so psycholinguistics um, is essentially, it's just the study of the representation, production, and processing of language in the brain. Um, so psycholinguistics would be a branch of cognitive science. Um, so you're really looking at taking kind of the field of linguistics, which is all about, um, you know, studying the inner workings of language and then understanding how uh, we do that with our brains <laughs> is sort of is uh, kind of the crux of psycholinguistics. Sure. So some people may have some understanding that uh, languages share grammar, right? That like most languages are going to have something resembling nouns, something resembling verbs. And, uh, you know, you'll, you'll have to sort of fill in the details here. But my, my understanding is that there's sort of like an architecture of language that it seems to be somewhat innate that humans kind of like build their own language, the specific languages on top of, right? That there's some sort of like, you know, phantom structure in the brain that can then be turned into English or Chinese or Russian or Spanish or whatever, but that we have kind of like built in modules for how we think about and process language. Is that accurate? Yeah. Um, so that, yes, that is kind of the dominant theory um, in w- a framework called generative grammar. And this is a framework that comes from, well, in large part, Noam Chomsky was a huge pioneer in this field. And and I would say Noam Chomsky is probably one of the biggest figures in linguistics. Um, and his whole kind of idea is that, you know, he he's looking at what B.F. Skinner, um, who's a, a behaviorist, is Uh, you know, what he's writing about learning and language and how humans um, adopt behaviors. Um, And he's, he's like, man, I don't, I really don't think that this whole, like, the mind is a tabula rasa thing really applies to language. Like, I don't think that- Meaning blank slate, right? It's just like, okay, you're totally blank slate and just kind of learn whatever you're taught. Right, right. So the idea, I guess, if I back it up, like, the behaviorist idea about language, um, and B.F. Skinner is is just a psychologist that's um, well recognized for his behaviorist theorems. But it's sort of like this idea that um, you you learn language by tr- almost like trial and error, by like conditioning and reinforcement. Um, and Noam Chomsky's whole argument against that is, you know, like, sure, that might work for, like, tying your shoes or learning your manners or, um, 
you know, understanding like what, what sort of behavior applies to certain social situations, but language is such a complicated, um, tool that everybody uses. How in the world can (laughs) a system that leads to things like tying your shoes also lead to all of us being able to construct and understand new concepts, um, new experiences, um, you know, to, to learn how to represent language with uh, the written word, you know, so that those kinds of questions really led him to develop this idea that humans are sort of like pre-programmed, if you will, with like a language acquisition device. And whatever this is, it's sort of empowered by exactly what you are talking about, this universal grammar that enables everybody to learn language. Um, And universal grammar is, it's kind of, it's a difficult thing to like, to sort of wrap your head around because a lot of people associate grammar with, you know, things you learn in school, like do put a comma here, don't put a comma there, don't end a sentence with a preposition, like that kind of stuff. Um, But really grammar is like, is, is an underlying sort of series of rules and principles that allow uh, language to be formed and language to be understood. So universal grammar is like this really abstract idea that language can be, like has to function in a certain way. That makes sense. And, and because of that, every human can learn language by being immersed in an environment with it, if that makes sense. Yeah, sure. So something, you know, while we're trying to make uh, fitness analogies to um, linguistics, it, it I'm just thinking about like, how could we try to connect this to something that might be a little bit more tangible for folks listening? So an example may be something like, okay, human beings have certain ways that their bodies can move, and then they can turn those into CrossFit, Cirque du Soleil, strongman, running, gymnastics, whatever, right? But but all of those different sports and movement patterns are going to be based upon certain fundamental aspects of the way our joints work and how we move around. So even though what someone is doing may look totally different, in some ways, it's still built upon certain aspects of human physiology that are, that are kind of fundamental to the organism. I don't think that's a perfect analogy, but that might be somewhat useful. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think the idea of generative grammar or, you know, this idea that like humans are born with this innate capacity to learn language is very similar to the idea that we're born with this innate capacity to learn to walk. If that makes sense. Like it's, it's kind of the same principle and it has to do, and it's kind of like driven or powered by similar to walking. Like there are these you know, the, the underlying mechanisms of your muscles and your joints that, that enable you to, and, and like neurons that enable you to walk. And similarly, there's like these innate sort of, um, there's an innate series of principles that allow for language to happen. If that, yeah, that, I I thought that was a really good analogy. Yeah, it, it, I like the idea of the the developmental process since a lot of, um, you know, sort of movement and physical therapy uh, paradigms, especially uh, folks coming out of the, the Czech Republic, have sort of dug into the way that humans tend to develop and the sort of standard development of movements and the way that people um, actually learn to acquire motor patterns as children, which, you know, follows sort of a script, as you were saying, and are actually able to utilize that in developing rehab principles for adults. So kind of interesting there to see like another parallel of like, okay, you can sort of see that something is built in here in the way that humans first learn to do this. And then they learn to roll over and lift their head a certain way. And then they learn to go onto their side. And it just kind of is, it's built in very clearly since just about everyone does it. And if someone doesn't do it, that's indicative of some sort of developmental problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, exactly. And I think Another, um, I guess another sort of series of parallels that 
to me helps with understanding kind of like language acquisition is so when you when you look at spoken language there is that sort of the process of acquiring it um, is seemingly like pre-programmed in a way um, similar to the process of learning to walk but learning how to do a backflip or learning how to do a clean and jerk is not something you're born knowing how to do it's something that you you use your other sort of skill sets that some might be innate, some might be learned, but you kind of like compile them together to be able to learn how to do a clean and jerk or a backflip. The same thing applies to written language. So written language isn't necessarily pre-programmed. It's, it's like a skill that you use spoken language to help you learn, if that makes sense. So there's like kind of these layers of innate kind of capacity that um, are like compounded with with learning and and new skills that enable you to do like more and more complex things. Yeah. And you can sort of hack the innate capacities together in order to develop a new thing. Like writing is a great example of that where, um, you know, I'm certainly not an expert in any of this stuff and I'm kind of talking out of turn, but there seems to be uh, some sort of inherent trade-off between the ability to learn to read and then our sort of um, ability to to recognize certain aspects of our visual field, right? In terms of uh, uh, recognizing patterns in nature or, um, being able to to remember faces and things like that, that there does seem to be some sort of like zero sum competition for the for the visual cortex where you like have this innate language skill, you have this innate um, visual recognition skill, and then you can kind of force those together into learning to read and write, but then you're actually potentially subtracting from uh, other abilities that humans are kind of built to do, so to speak. Yeah, that is so interesting that you touched on that, um, and especially that you you brought together the facial recognition and written language pieces, um, because there's actually it's it's I think this is wild, but there's actually been studies on stroke patients who then have diminished or impaired written language capacity, whereas before they were able to read and write, and uh, you can actually like sort of re-teach someone how to read and write. And what they end up doing is using portions, using neurons that they would have used for facial recognition otherwise. To Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's kind of cool. So there's, and that kind of ties into the whole idea of like neuroplasticity, you know, like our 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 habits and our skill sets and our um, capabilities aren't, fixed. Um, we can always grow new neural pathways. Um, I guess grow is the wrong word, maybe forge, <laughs> forge new neural pathways and, um, and even adapt certain neural substrates or structures that we use for one task and use those for another. And there's a lot of emerging research on like, you know, how closely related are the two tasks or how closely related do they have to be? And it's really fascinating. There's a lot of cool new stuff um, coming out of cognitive science in general. Um, so that's that's cool that you that you mentioned that. Yeah, you know, it's one of those one of those little things I picked up somewhere, and who knows how actually accurate it is. And I'm sure you know experts in the field would be like, well, hold on, there's trade offs here. It only happens in this situation, it only happens in others. But I, I you know, I, as you mentioned, the idea of having some sort of innate capacity as well as these abilities to kind of take different things and slam them together and rewire certain aspects of our physiology to take on new tasks, I think is super, super interesting. And yeah. so, you know, general framework of like, okay, our brains are pretty bizarre and cool yeah. and language is bizarre and cool and skill acquisition is bizarre and cool. Um, the, the article that you wrote was focused on a, a concept called optimality theory, which, you know, seems to be, you know, we're talking about these different layers of language acquisition and development, all that kind of stuff. It seems to be on a slightly different layer than some of the things that we've been talking about related to actually generating uh, speech and, and language. So can you sort of explain where optimality theory sits in relation to some of these other concepts we're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, th I guess the... The where I should probably start is 
just to explain broadly what optimality theory is all about. Um, and in, in like the most, I guess, straightforward terms that I can think of, optimality theory is um, in linguistics. It's this idea that you, that you have an input, which could be like someone speaking to you or, um, or it could be a thought in your head. So that's like an input. And then you have a series of, you have principles and constraints that basically like inhibit you from choosing certain ways to respond or outputs. Um, and, and like your brain, the idea behind optimality theory is that you come up with outputs and outputs could be like you interpreting what someone says, or it could be you producing some language. Um, you come up with that after ranking these constraints and using them to select the optimal output. So it's like a series, it, it's basically a way of mapping inputs and outputs in language. And um, it was first kind of brought into the world of linguistics by two professors, um, Dr. Alan Prince of Rutgers and Dr. Paul Smolinski of um, Johns Hopkins University in a talk that they gave. Um, and so basically they are using optimality theory or this idea that we have like principles that give us constraints as a way to understand universal grammar. So that really like esoteric thing that I was talking about before, that's like this underlying structure that enables everybody to um, acquire language, they're saying that optimality theory can fit the bill for that. Um, so it's sort of related to, to what we're discussing in that it's kind of like a tangible, um, it's like the answer to what universal grammar is supposed to do if that makes sense. So it's, so it sort of fits in, in that way. And it helps us, um, it's used to map everything from, from like the sounds used in language to the way you can form words, to the way that, uh, you can form sentences to the way that you acquire language, like this sort of the process that you go through. Um, so it kind of fills that, that, esoteric void of universal grammar in a way. Sure. So, so let me try to summarize this to see if, uh, if I have it right. And if this, this chain of reasoning makes sense. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if you're a human existing in the world, there's a lot of stuff potentially, um, that you need to do, that you need to communicate, that, um, you need to process, et cetera. And so you have these, these thoughts that are potentially occurring in your head, you have these sensory inputs that are potentially coming in from outside. And then those things need to be somehow converted into either internal processing or potentially some sort of external communication. Yes. And we talked previously about this idea of universal grammar, which implies that there is some sort of innate structure to the way that humans process and communicate information that kind of is built into our brains. And the exact yes. details of how we do that is potentially going to be different if we're you know, raised in a different country or have different cultures or what have you. But we have this innate structure that in enables us to process inputs and simultaneously like create some sort of communication to other people. And so what you're saying is that optimality theory is essentially, okay, there's all this stuff that's going on and then we need to be able to rank those things or, 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 or process those things relative to different priorities and trade-offs. And that could be from actually creating um, some sort of sentence that we want to communicate. It could be related to the exact, um, let's say, syllables that we're using to, to create a language, et cetera. But that the idea is that we need to have some series of constraints that we're using to develop 
you know, specific words or communicate our thoughts. And that optimality theory essentially explains how that process occurs. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, ex- yeah, it, I love that. And it's really, it's, it's the idea. Okay. So it stands in contrast to this idea that, um, the way that we process and produce language is according to rules. So if you like, if you think about a rule, um, as in like, okay, every sentence must have a verb, like there must be an action that you're, um, this is just kind of, I'm just pulling this out of the blue, but like everything, there must be an event in a, in a sentence and optimality theory kind of turns that, um, it kind of inverts that structure because although it makes sort of sense to think that, okay, language is governed by rules that help people understand things. Um, when you start actually mapping out those rules, and I, I wonder from your background too, if, if this ever happens in, um, engineering, but if you start like applying rules, it gets to be really hard to map every single rule and every single exception to every single rule as a separate rule. And it just gets to be this like very convoluted picture of what's going on versus. Because sure. every edge case requires a separate rule, right? It's like, oh yeah, you always need to have a verb in a sentence, but what about when you are speaking colloquially with someone and you're just like, hey, you. It's like, okay, well, yeah. you don't need a verb in this kind of sentence. And then you end up having, you know, 49 rules for that. And then you end up having another bunch of rules, like English spelling is an example. Okay, well, you know, I before E except after C or in cases of A, such as neighbor and way. It's just like thousands and thousands of specific rules, which ends up being a, a an unsustainable way to actually uh, create something. Is that is that sort of what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. And it's, um, and so optimality theory, the way that it kind of looks at modeling language is instead um, basically looking at like language as governed by like these principles, like principle of economy. You know, you want to say everything that's necessary and not more, for example, like you don't want to, um, you're not going to give over much information, but you also want to try to, um, not give under much information so that people can understand you. Um, so that's one principle. And that principle has, um, lots of constraints on it, it imposes constraints on language. So instead of looking at language as like the output of series of like a series of rules, we're looking at language as like what, what we see, or sorry, what we experience in real life with language is like the result of humans ranking constraints. Like a, a great example is, um, and this is just going to be a really kind of simple example, but let's say in English, you have two friends, Peter and Paul go to the park. And then you want to say that Peter brought um, cheese. <laughs> well, if you say Peter and Paul went to the park, he brought cheese, and you use that pronoun he, um, you are, you, you know, you're, you, you are abiding by the principle of economy in some ways because you're not repeating someone's name again, but you're violating a different principle in language. Um, you're violating the principle uh, that the person you're speaking to must be able to understand you, which is like a faithfulness principle. And so instead, in that situation, if you want someone to know who brought cheese, you have to violate one of those principles. And you're going to violate the one that ranks lower in your in your sort of grammatical structure. So you're going to say like, well, I wish I didn't have to say the name Peter again, <laughs> but I have to. So Peter and Paul went to the park. Peter brought cheese. 
Sure. If that right. makes and just, sense. And just, yeah, and just to clarify, it's because if you said he brought cheese, it could refer to either Peter or Paul, right? And right. if we want to know who the real cheese man is in this situation, <laughs> we need to repeat their name. Yes, exactly. And that, uh, you know, th- that is like a very kind of pared down example of, of what's happening. But I think it, it provides a good illustration, or at least it helps, it helped me kind of understand what the idea is. So the idea is, is basically like, you know, we have all of these various options when we are, you know, getting ready to produce an output in language, whether that's saying something or thinking some, or like a understanding something. And if we didn't have constraints that were ranked, we just like language wouldn't work. We, we would just be kind of, it would be analysis paralysis. We'd be stuck in this um, void of having way too many options and not knowing which ones are the right option. Um, so that's, that's where optimality comes into the picture is that it provides a model for what we do um, and, and often without knowing it and often like in, you know, like a fraction of a second, which is really cool. Sure. So, you know, the, another example and something like, uh, like running a business might be having a lot of different metrics to sort of say, okay, we want to make sure we're doing a certain amount of a positive activity, but not doing it so often that we get some sort of negative outcome from it. Right. Where it's like, okay, say you have a bunch of support tickets for some business that you're running that requires a lot of customer service. You have some software, uh, software as a service business. And you're like, okay, cool. We want to get through our support tickets in a certain amount of time. And then you maybe also have something that's like rate the quality of support you received. Because if you only incentivized the speed of support, you might get people just doing a really bad job and not actually solving people's problems and being rude to them. So it's like, okay, well, we need to have a certain amount of support tickets done or a certain average time per support ticket, but not at the cost of dropping the, the you know, how is your experience today score too low? Is, is that like a, a similar example? Yes, yes. And this is where I think the concept of like having principles or constraints and and actions being a result of of those being ranked is so applicable to so many things so it's to me when i learned about optimality theory i i just thought i thought it was like groundbreaking in my understanding of language and then when you think about it as as a uh, that framework could apply to other things. It's, in my opinion, it's, it's so, uh, it's so illuminating. Um, and, you know, just to take an example from fitness, um, and, and of course, like here, I'm just, I'm going to say something that's like way oversimplified, but, um, like, so recently, I decided to sign up for a, um, an endurance event. And when planning the training for this event, um, I went to my husband, Zach, who is the founder of Strength Ratio, one of the co- co-owners. And I was like, hey, I have this endurance event that I signed up for. And I did that because, you know, it's quarantine and I really enjoy getting out on my bike. So I might as well train um, for a triathlon. And, and so here, so I want to change my training and I, I want to, you know, obviously become more enduring and get faster. And I also want to get stronger and I also want to continue building muscle. And what Zach responded initially was, okay, well, which of those are your highest priority? Like which of those are, which of those goals do you want to, you know, reach at, at any cost in your fitness world and which goals are you willing to kind of sacrifice and to what extent. And that enabled me to kind of look at those things and rank what I actually wanted to do, you know, rank. Okay. Well in this, during this period of my life, like honestly getting outside is so important to me. So I'm going to rank training, you know, performance in this event, which is to say like 
improving my endurance, improving my speed, um, and building the strength that will help prevent injury over continuing to, you know, build muscle, um, for aesthetic reasons. (laughs) And, um, and that was the only way, you know, me kind of ranking those goals, um, to arrive at the structure of like a program. Um, so I had to rank them and I had to violate sort of the, or sacrifice some elements of a goal in order to accomplish another goal. Sure. And there's, there's trade-offs there in terms of both the amount of time you can spend training and adapting to training. Yeah. Right? So sort of like we were talking about before in terms of like space in the visual cortex for different types of activities, there is at some, at some point a, a zero sum competition for like, okay, how many hours can you train and can you recover it? And then there's also the actual competing physiological adaptations where it's like, okay, if you're trying to get your body to adapt, to adapt in this way, it might actually take away from your ability to adapt in the other way. So there's, there's constraints in like multiple, um, areas there. Absolutely. Yes. And, and sort of the, the level of complexity there with training, when you start to look at, you know, like bioenergetic systems, um, and, and to really break down different elements of training into like their constituent parts, um, you, I think that's a really great kind of analogy for what is going on um, in your brain according to optimality theory with language. Um, so, so there's kind of, you can look at it at optimality theory and how it affects language on sort of a large scale, like um, when you're interacting with someone, for example, um, and let, like, let's say you're a coach, Um, and you're trying to explain a concept to an athlete, there's so many ways that you could explain that concept, but you're going to take your understanding of the perspective that that athlete has as some constraint on what you can produce in terms of language. That's like kind of a macro level, you know, like if you're a coach that has Um, a long history in exercise and sports science, and you've been involved in research, and you have an athlete who comes from a completely different field and isn't as familiar with, um, you know, like physiological terms, you're not going to start using like the Latin anatomical words for like parts of the body to explain something to this person. Instead, you're going to use something that's tangible to them even if it's not as scientifically accurate as a different explanation. So you're going to violate sort of scientific accuracy or sacrifice it in order to communicate effectively to get the outcome you want, which is the athlete understanding, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. I mean, it, and we're kind of bouncing back and forth in this conversation where it's like, okay, let's talk about something a little bit more abstract and then let's maybe try to give a, a specific analogy um, in another area that might resonate more with people and just, just keep flipping back and forth in hopes of actually um, touching on something that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and let me know. I, I think I also have a tendency to get really excited about a concept and go down a rabbit hole. So, uh, feel free to kind of corral me back to, <laughs> to, uh, I think that's, th- that's literally the point of this podcast. So <laughs> We're all good. Yeah. So let me ask you, let me ask you this since it seems that, you know, just sort of thinking through these concepts, it seems like there's, there's sort of like, um, let's call it like positive prioritization and negative prioritization, meaning that if we use, um, your training example, right. Where it's like, okay, I want to prioritize my improvement in, uh, you said it was a triathlon. Is that right? Yeah, I want to I want to prioritize my improvement in endurance, um, you know, running, biking and swimming, and I'm willing to prioritize that over increasing my muscle mass or learning to 
you know, get better at certain gymnastics movements or snatching more weight or whatever else you might be potentially interested in doing. So you're, so you're, you're saying, okay, in terms of what I want to improve the most, I want to improve this thing the most, and I'm willing to do that at the cost of improving other things. However, you can also think of a constraint like, okay, I, I want to get as good of a, you know, a good, as good of a time as possible on this triathlon, but I'm not willing to let my back squat drop below a certain number, or I'm not willing to lose a certain amount of muscle mass, which I would think of as like a negative constraint rather than a positive constraint. Does optimality theory have, uh, any way of of thinking about the differences between those types of constraints? Or is that something that just kind of like, whatever shakes out since it's like, okay, well, you're just sort of prioritizing, uh, based upon any number of those constraints. Mm, Yeah, that, that is a great question. Um, and I, so the way that, um, constraints within different elements of linguistics are set up, um, typically they're, they're not going to correlate exactly to these kinds of valuations that a person might have with respect to like their, um, experience in life, if that makes sense. So, so it's not necessarily like a perfect correlation, but, um, I guess in linguistics, your, the constraints are, are just going to be, um, I would say like neutral is probably the best word for them. Like they're just going to be kind of like a, um, uh, an outpouring of a principle or an extension of a principle. So, um, they're not necessarily going to say like you, I guess you could, with any constraint, you could phrase it as you can't do a thing or you must do a thing. Either way, um, the way that constraints interact is as long as the like fidelity to what the constraint is supposed to do remains, it's going to be the same. Um, so I, I don't know that that core, if I understood the question correctly, I don't know if it, if that kind of positive and negative valuation is directly correlative. Um, but it's, it's also not a, like, you can certainly look at optimality theory, um, especially if you are going to apply the principles to other fields, you can look at those constraints in that way. And it's, it's helpful too, I think. Sure. So in in terms of language, the constraints are probably going to be more typically in the, the, the sort of like negative way that I was talking about where Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, this violates the sort of like in your example about uh, Peter, Paul and cheese, where it's like, this violates the, the clarity principle too much and is too negative in terms of clarity. So that, that needs to be fixed or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I, you know, there's, I would say like in a lot of ways, there's an attempt with the constraints to make them so that there's not like a, a sort of spectrum. There's either like you are, or you're not violating it, violating a a constraint, if that makes sense. So, so if there is like a spectrum they're like, I'm violating this a little bit, or I think that's where the comparison might break down. Um, sure, yeah. That's, yeah, that's kind of the crux of it is like, okay, well, there's, when I'm talking about endurance training and I'm talking about like, I only have X amount of time and, um, you know, I have these other goals, but like, I can't achieve all of them optimally, <laughs> you know, at the yeah. same time, based on my time, I can, there's like a spectrum of emphasis and de-emphasis that I can kind of work with in a, in a program. And when we are, you know, if we're looking at optimality theory in how it maps language, it's really attempting, the constraints are trying to get to this, like, almost like binary zero one, like yes, no sure. kind of thing. Yeah. 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 So this was either clear or it wasn't clear. This was either succinct or it wasn't succinct or whatever, rather than like, oh, I improved my back squat by 10 pounds over, you know, three months, but I could have improved it by 15 pounds, which 
you know, has like an actual, um, whatever quality to it. Like it's, it's on a spectrum, like you said. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the reason in language that there is, is kind of like that you can arrive or like map these binary things is because there are so many constraints at play at once. Um, and, and I think like part of the process of, of like using optimality theory to understand language is delving into how like uncover or identifying constraints that seem to be at play, um, even if they haven't been identified before, if that makes sense. So do you, do you have an example? Um, yeah. So there, so, okay. So if in a sentence, um, like let's say that you are talking, you personally are talking with about a male friend and you have pronouns that you can use to refer to you and your male friend. That's he and himself. So there's like the personal pro pronoun and then there's himself, which is um, either reflexive or intensive, if that makes sense. So like with these pronouns, there's they can either they can be used for many different types of purposes, I guess, but they're all referring to um, a, a sort of a male that came up previously previously in conversation. Um, so you with me so far? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, so there um, there are like these broad categories of constraints. Some are called uh, faithfulness constraints. And that has to do with like the principle that the output of language has to match the input as closely as possible. And then there's the, con the markedness constraints, which is another class and markedness constraints are really interesting. Um, because what they have to do with is, um, contributing to our idea of well formedness. Like when you hear something that someone says, is it prop, do you like, is it properly formed in your mind? Does it sound right? Essentially. <laughs> and so when, and, and, and by that, do you sort of mean just the, the grammar and all that sort of stuff where, you know, say you're, you're listening to someone who is not a native speaker of whatever language you're speaking and they say something that makes sense, but just sounds off. Is that the, the concept for, for marketness? Yes. Right. Okay. So this, this idea, like if something sounds off, um, yeah. it might be uh, like ostensibly correct, but it, yeah. but like something's going on in your brain that's telling you that that's, that's not right in some way. Yeah, there, there, there's there's funny examples of that of um, uh, you know Russian disinformation campaigns on Facebook, where you know they have people who obviously speak English very well, but it's just slightly weird. Like there's just a few things that are sort of weird grammatically, and then uh, I think one of the examples of of people realizing, oh wait, this is a Russian campaign, is that the uh, they would put the dollar sign after money. In, oh, in in writing, yeah, uh -huh. right, and it's like, oh, this makes so much sense because the grammar is like good, but just a little bit off, and like, oh, this is a Russian convention, not a, a normal native English speech, speaker convention. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah, and okay. So within, so as it turns out, when children are, so I'm going to tie all this together. So when children are learning to use pronouns. Um, and let's say that they want to speak um, about, they want to explain that their male friend um, did something that, like, to himself, it's reflexive, like, saw himself in the mirror. Um, learning how to, learning to say himself instead of he in that situation is actually a process of ranking markedness constraints and faithfulness constraints. And the more that scientists are studying 
children who are learning how to use pronouns, like when to use the personal program pronoun, the reflexive and the intensive, the more they're understanding that actually children over time are changing the rankings of these markedness and faithfulness constraints. Um, so they're, they're actually like, they are producing language according to certain constraints, but in the wrong rankings at first based on just their development in language over time. So does that, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but it's sort of like an ongoing area of investigation where they're, where scientists are finding that the, you can take um, certain constraints, put them in a different environment, like maybe language acquisition where they haven't been used before, and now look at them in a different way, potentially discover a new constraint at play, or I, or like change your, the way that you actually like think about that constraint. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, sure. So to, to kind of dig into that example a little bit to, to make sure I understand what you're saying. So if you have children who are, we can use the example of he saw himself in the mirror, Right. Would that would that be an example of like what you're talking about? Yes. Yes. So right. So it's like okay, you're you're referring to a person who was brought up previously in the conversation, and you you sort of are uh, you know speaking about that person who is already introduced, and then the himself is the the sort of like reflexive use to be like okay, he saw himself, and that that's how someone who you know, is, is a, a native English speaker would say it, but a child might say, what, what would they potentially say instead of that? Would they just say he saw he in the mirror or he saw him in the mirror? Oh, for okay. I yeah, see. Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Sorry. I totally left that out, but yeah. So at first we have like this idea. So like the child is learning recursion, like, okay, I can use these pronouns to refer to someone that has already been talked about before. Um, and so I'm just going to use them. And I figured out how to change them based on who's the subject, who's the object, you know. And so I have these all these constraints around, you know, what which pronouns I can use when. And so I'm going to use them. He saw him in the mirror. And to someone who's listening, that is going to sound off. And it's the reason why it's off there is kind of is, is complex. And you're not necessarily in the moment being like, oh, well, actually, you know, he saw him in the mirror. Uh, him is the unmarked form. And that typically refers to a different individual um, when there's already another he used in the sentence. So so you must mean that he saw a completely novel individual in the mirror, which just does not <laughs> make sense um, in terms of like, I guess that could feasibly happen in the world, but it's not, you know that that's not what the child is trying to say. And so eventually the child learns to pick up another form and use that form in that situation, um, which is himself. Um, and that's going to involve like changing um, the, the sort of ranking of constraints over time. Got it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. And so the idea then is that the, the child then starts to weight the markedness constraint higher than the other constraints as they develop further. Yes. Yes. And, and to learn, yeah, to learn, um, new, yeah, to learn, to, to learn new constraints as well. Um, yeah. That's, that's a great, thank you for following me with that. I feel like that was all over the place, but. No, it's great. It's interesting. I, I, yeah. I like when I get to learn stuff doing these podcasts. So ha happy to, happy to try to parse it out. And I figure, yeah. you know, if I, if I'm going to parse it out and try to understand it, that hopefully the people listening can as well. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, you know, there's so much research, um, out there. And, and actually where I was introduced to optimality theory was through work by Dr. Legendre, who's another professor at, um, Johns Hopkins university. And I, so 
I guess my whole kind of journey into this started when I was a teacher. And as a teacher for middle and high school students, I kept noticing interesting like derivations and language use and um, and also interesting phenomenon or phenomena where like, you know, for example, I, I once had a student who could speak who was an excellent sort of reader. She was always, you know, uh, engaged with books that were way above her grade level. Um, But when she spoke, she had issues with this pronoun situation that I was sort of just alluding to, like using the right pronouns when. She would use like subject pronouns when she wanted to use an object pronoun. And, And so it was just like a fascinating thing for me because I guess, you know, in the field of teaching, at least when I was coming into it, I wasn't exposed to all the nuance of language. And it was kind of assumed, like, if you had someone who's an exceptional reader, they were probably great at spoken language too. Um, Or at least like had a grasp of certain like grammatical um, and like conventions, but it turned out to, there were situations where I was finding this wasn't the case. And that brought me to being more interested in syntax, like morphosyntax, like sentence structure and the structure of words and how those things interact to create meaning and what happens when things go wrong. Like why, why is there Why are there situations when, where someone could be really proficient in one area, but then have some, some difficulties in another? And that brought me to Dr. Legendre's work because she does a lot um, with morphosyntax and optimality theory and language acquisition, which is cool. Um, So, you know, I would say like for, I am nowhere near an expert in optimality theory, but I think it's absolutely fascinating. And when you start really using it to delve into what's going on linguistically, um, it's, it's really illuminating, um, not only for how, how language is typically used, but also in explaining what, like what is going wrong when we perceive as something's off with language or like why there are certain difficulties, why some learners might have difficulties with some aspects of language. So there's a lot of um, utility in, in optimality theory outside of just mapping language. Yeah. So that I, well, let's let's take this tangent for a second, since this is something that I think is really interesting. Um, and we can use some uh, potentially inflammatory topical examples as well, right? Say we yeah. have a presidential candidate prone <laughs> to saying like bizarre gaffes all the time, and yeah. you know, people are like, "Oh my God, Biden's brain is melting! Like he's got dementia, et cetera. And like you know, so, some of that may be true, but he also has a history of just sort of saying like weird stuff that kind of doesn't make any sense and is very clearly a pretty smart guy. Right. And, you know, you go back um, a few years and you have George W. Bush, who similarly just said bizarre stuff all the time. You know, people would be like, this guy's an idiot, whatever. And it's like, okay, maybe he is, but like, I don't think that's the full story. There, there seems to be some sort of disconnect between what he's thinking and what he's saying. Right. And, you know, I, not, not, not to put him on blast, but I, but I grew up with someone in my household who very similarly seems to just like have a pretty hard time converting his actual thoughts into words. And it can sound sort of muddled and, you know, it can sort of be like, what are you talking about, man? But it's also like, you know, it, there, there's, there's something going wrong in the conversion of the thought into language. And it sounds like maybe that might be similar to the the student that you're talking about. I mean, those are three totally separate examples of people who you don't know, but, but what do you think is actually going on in those types of situations? Yeah. Okay. There, there is so much, um, research going on to kind of determine what, what actually is going on on, on like a neurological level, um, and how that impacts like the, the output of language. But one thing that, um, I, you know, that just kind of came to mind as you were bringing up some of those examples 
Um, so there, so with language production and processing, um, there is an important kind of piece that that uh, comes along with that, and it's uh, theory of mind. And theory of mind is essentially it's, it's the idea that uh, someone else has a mind as complicated and nuanced and competent and um, <laughs> and uh, multifaceted as yours, and that their mind is capable of coming up with opinions and feelings and perceptions that are different than yours, and that you can that this mind can is interpreting what you say, um, and is also when this mind produces language, is they're trying to produce it so that you can interpret it. So there's almost this like bi-directional understanding going on where you're, you're sitting there and you know, this is completely unconscious, but like your brain's, your brain's like, oh yeah, I'm talking to this person and I know that they have to interpret what I'm saying. And that, so therefore I have to speak in a way that's interpretable for them. And I know when they're saying something, they're trying to say something that I can interpret. So they're, I know that they're thinking about me and it's this whole like kind of, uh, interesting, like mental gymnastics going on. But this, this theory of mind is, is like fundamental to, um, optimality theory as well. And because a lot of the constraints are, uh, like sort of based in the idea that anything you say has to be interpreted. So like it had like anything that you produce linguistically has to be processed by a mind. Um, and sometimes, and I'm not saying that this is the case cause I, I have, you know, I have no idea with those particular situations, but sometimes, um, when there's a delay in the development of the theory of a theory of mind or a theory of mind that isn't um, as robust, that absolutely can impact language. Um, and sometimes this is something that's like, you know, uh, you might see in children that have specific language impairment, but also I think it can happen um, or the same concept can happen when you're speaking, but you don't like directly see or know who you're speaking to. So if you're like a president, a presidential candidate and you're just speaking, you're just making an address, but you don't have a clear idea who you're addressing. I think that the impact can be similar, um, in that, now your rankings of principles kind of get muddled. Um, That's really interesting. Yeah. Now, okay, that that is like pure Courtney Kelly <laughs> right there, that extension. Sure. Um, yeah. But, yeah, but I think, I mean, it's, it's a concept that I think holds, or at least it's been helpful for me to hold in my mind, um, especially when it comes to writing any, th you know, marketing copy, for example. If I'm just writing sure. it and not imagining who's going to read it, um, I, I might write something that's like totally uninteresting and absolutely doesn't communicate what I want it to, you know? So, so, so yeah, so that, that can impact, I think the, um, theory of mind absolutely can have a, a massive impact on, um, language processing and production. Yeah, that's really fascinating that the the ability to sort of properly imagine the the processing of the audience or the individual you're speaking to is going to be key to having clear communication. If something goes wrong with that avatar of like who you're speaking to, then yeah, you can just end up saying strange stuff. Cool. That makes a lot of sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, so you were, you started to touch on copywriting, which I wanted to to dig into a little bit, since you know we're talking about linguistics, we're talking about theory of mind, et cetera. And like you said, you know, if you're writing copy on a website or you know trying to send an email to someone or what have you, that 
you know, if you, especially if you want to persuade them to do something like sign up for a fitness program or come into a gym or actually do their exercise program or what have you, you know, you, you have to, to, like you said, have a robust theory of mind of like, okay, where's this person at? What are their potential obstacles? What are they thinking? What are they worried about? So, you know, what, what does that process actually look like in terms of coming up with copy that gets people to do something? Yeah. Um, well, I, yeah, so it, it, um, definitely starts with a term that you just used, but that's like creating an avatar. Um, so, so thinking about exactly in, in your, in each moment, or instance of writing something, you're thinking about like, who is the person that you're trying to speak to? And, and just as a concrete example, um, recently I, uh, helped with the development of a new program that strength ratio is rolling out whenever, you know, uh, we can open the gym at, at full capacity, whenever that is. Um, but it's, it's a foundations program and, so um, one of the foundation's courses is Intro to Strength, and it's really geared towards someone who has no experience, barbell training, strength training, um, and for whom you know the gym might be a pretty intimidating experience. Um, so when I speak to this, to this avatar, I'm going to be using language that's very different than the language that I use when I speak, when I'm trying to um, speak about programming that one of our coaches can do for elite athletes. Um, I'm going to be catering to someone that, um, I know is like, I I've kind of outlined what their goals are, um, or different classes of goals. I've outlined the kinds of things that might be difficult for them or might be barriers for them in, in signing up. And I've thought about, um, you know, what prior experiences this kind of person might have before they interact with what I've written. Um, and, and this process of me kind of laying out this map is not just me by myself. It also involves asking people like me calling up relatives who might not have done as much strength training and be like, Hey, like how, you know, how do you feel when, like, what does it feel like to come across this kind of messaging or that kind of messaging? And, and, um, why, why does a barbell feel intimidating? Like, tell me kind of what your experiences are that led you to believe that. And, and what kinds of like fears do you have around, um, starting a process like an intro to strength course, but yet why are you interested in it? Like what is kind of drawing you in? Um, and, and truly just like, just asking people, um, that, you know, who might kind of be in a similar position to the person that you're writing for is, is absolutely a part of the process, I would say. Um, and so once you've kind of constructed this, this like very fleshed out avatar, um, then you can start drafting language that's really geared that, that they're going to respond, hopefully respond well to. And then of course, there's the whole aftermath, um, of seeing how the responses went, where they, you know, did, did things go well or, or did your marketing not seem to be effective and how, you know, and then adjusting, um, and again, like re- taking in data, seeing how your adjustments performed, and recalibrating. And, um, over time, I think you get better and better at, uh, honing in on the particular language you need to use in different situations and with different people. So it sounds like the, the most important skill of a copywriter isn't necessarily the actual writing itself. It's developing a very robust theory of mind of the specific person who you are trying to communicate with. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's funny, as you said that I was like, Hmm, is writing really, uh, extricable from that? Like, I guess, you know, it's, this is where I, I really kind of like differ than a lot of 
you know, maybe some of my uh, English major peers in a, in a way, um, because to me, to me, okay, so I, one of my favorite authors is Kurt Vonnegut, and Kurt Vonnegut is all about how the point of language is to communicate something, and if it doesn't, if your reader is confused, then your writing's not good. Like, good writing doesn't make readers feel confused. And that's Vonnegut's approach, and that's kind of my, where I fall in the spectrum. But there are certainly, like if you, like if you look at James Joyce, who's a celebrated author who wrote Ulysses, um, you know, he would have a completely different opinion. It, for him, good writing is like writing that, for example, can, can uh, exactly mimic the you know, processes of thought. But as a result, when you try to read Ulysses, it, I mean, it's like a behemoth. I, I studied it and I still am confused <laughs> in a lot of things. And, and, and some people think that, you know, like some, for some people, good writing is kind of this, like, uh, it's like this exclusive club and it's like sort of arcane and, and, um, and, and like it, it is not understandable. Like there's, there's kind of that sentiment that, oh, if it's difficult to understand, maybe it's good writing. <laughs> and sure. yeah. And, and I would say like, in my opinion, I think that ha like understanding people and like, yeah, having a robust theory of mind and, and a lot of empathy, honestly, is what, is what really makes a good writer and especially copywriter. And I think, you know, copywriting is, um, it is, is, you know, contingent on to be a good copywriter, to sell things, to, um, to write like, you know, UX, UI copy that enable people to have an, a seamless experience on an app, for example, people need to understand. And so I think in the realm of copywriting, at least like that is absolutely true. And I suppose there's some debate in the realm of writing in general, but I would say, I would say that it's, you know, people need to understand you. And are you thinking about the, if, you, if say you're writing copy for, for something, are you thinking about the, the constraints on the person who is potentially, you know, reading your copy relative to whatever decision they're trying to make? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yes. And yeah. And I think the process of, of writing copy is very much like, to me, I view it in this kind of like optimality theory lens or from that lens because, okay, so if I'm trying to explain what is, uh, like, what is in a program, for example, like, what's in our signature program that we're selling, um, I could tell you exactly what's in it um, and explain, you know, the details of, like, the programming cycles and what they're designed to accomplish and all of that, but... In my mind, if I if I do that, if I have that kind of degree of fidelity to what's in the program, I'm actually sacrificing. I'm you know I might be intimidating the very person that I'm trying to empower because they might not have the background. They're just they're brand new to this world. They they might not have the background to understand like why these pro programs are written the way they are, or even have context for that. And so for me to start prattling off all of those things, I, I'm not abiding by the constraints that this reader has where they don't have the background um, to like, to really take that in for what it's worth. And they might not have the time They're you know, they're under time constraints too. So they don't, they might not have time to like read through this giant, kind of essay on, on why this program works really well and, and why it's great for beginners and, you know, all that stuff. So instead I have to think about like, all right, they're, they're coming from, they're coming to this program from, um, very likely a background where there's less familiarity with strength training and the, and exercise and sports science. And likely they don't have much time. 
And also very likely they, their attention is, um, like (laughs) there are so many different, um, especially online, like digital competitors for their attention. And they're probably like pretty exhausted by whatever process they've been going through to come to the right solution. Um, so I have to think about that, like the attention, they're exhausted. Yeah, and skeptical, not just exhausted, skeptical too, right? Yes, absolutely. Skeptical because, you know, I mean, there's, yeah, they, who knows? Like this person may have tried a bunch of different things and, and their feeling is like, okay, I, I don't know if this is the right like I, people keep telling me that strength training is good for me, but I've tried these different like free templates or whatever the case may be. And they were really hard to stick to and I didn't like them and, you know, all this stuff. So there, yeah, there might be like negative. Well, actually there probably are lots of negative associations with everything else that they're kind of coming across in like when it comes to strength training products and, and I guess what I, I just want to be clear, I'm not like saying that strength training products out there are bad, but just that it, there's every likelihood that this person is, is feeling like they, they are also kind of constrained in their actions by their past experiences, um, and their, uh, and, and the amount of time that they're willing to put in to, understanding a product so that they can make a decision about it, if that makes sense. So yeah, absolutely. Like I am 100% thinking about that person's experience and empathizing with it. You know, like we all have that experience where you're online and you're just trying to find, like you have a problem and you're just trying to find something that will solve the problem. A great example is a gym management platform. Um, Oh, sure. Oh my gosh. I went through so many. And by the time I got to the one that we have, I was just like, I was exhausted, really skeptical. I needed like the marketing needed to be very like, uh, succinct to the point. And I, I really like if, if the marketing had any sort of like superlatives associated with it or like you know, if the writing seemed to be overly, um, mm, so what I'm like, like exuberant, <laughs> I just yeah. like, didn't have time for that. It just didn't. And so I was bringing to the table, all of these sort of constraints that were governing my, how I was going to interpret the language. Um, and people, yeah. So that's, I kind of, I use that experience of myself as a consumer Um, and reflect on that often when I'm thinking about someone else that I'm sort of writing to. Yeah. And you know, in that situation, I think that's a great example as well, where you have a general idea of what you're looking for, but you're certainly not an expert in the ins and outs of all these different pieces of software and the ins and outs of exactly how they're developed and what they look like or whatever. And it's like, you sort of have a general idea of what you want and you're a little bit skeptical because like you said, there's a lot of overly exuberant copy that isn't terribly helpful and you maybe played with some of those pieces of software in the past at other people's gyms and you're like man this is like looks like it was built in 1998 nothing works like i don't want this one so yeah it's you're, you know you're coming in with a lot of like quote unquote baggage essentially and so the role of the copywriter is to understand like okay this is where someone is at this is their potential level of expertise in this area how can i speak to them in a way that actually resonates with them and doesn't sort of you know whatever push the buttons of the the negative experiences they've had in the past mhm yeah, absolutely. And, and just knowing that, like, so this is, this is sort of a tangent, but just knowing that when in, in the world that we live in today, like there's just so much competition all the time for people's attention. If you like impacting someone in a negative way with your copy is, um, you know, that's, that's kind of like game over. Like, even if it's just like a one little thing that didn't sit right, there's so much, like so many other messages that people are getting. You, you just kind of, you have to, you have to really be cautious and careful about this, the type of language that you use. Um, 
And that means that you really need to be specific about who you're speaking to, because it's really, it's impossible to write something that will resonate with everybody. And you shouldn't try to do that. Um, you know, that I, th- I think in, in attempting to do that, um, you're, you're going to end up with something that just isn't, um, effective at all. Like doesn't, um, doesn't communicate anything at all in particular. (laughs) And so being specific about the person that you're trying to reach will mean that you use language that might turn a different kind of person away from you, but that's okay because you're trying to reach someone who you can serve well with your product or your service. And you're, you, you don't necessarily want to reach as effectively people that you can't really like that, that won't benefit from what you have to offer. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah. It's, it's, it's about understanding like, okay, this is, this is the exact person who we want. You know, say you have a, a strength training program, you're trying to sell people and yeah, you might be okay with getting some people in there who are a little, who are a little bit intimidated by barbells, but you know, at, at some level it's like, okay, if you are just terrified beyond all belief and, you know, are never going to touch a barbell, like this just isn't for you. And, you know, it's okay to draw that line somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, I, something that, um, and that comes up a lot just as a specific example in, in our marketing. Um, so we like the, the way that we program for group classes, for example, is, um, really geared towards someone who's, who, is interested in, um, their fitness practice being like a very long term practice and who is okay with, um, the idea that programs are going to fluctuate and not every day is going to be like all out, you know, just like you end up on the ground, um, and you get that kind of like feeling and satisfaction of like, uh, you know, the, the extremely high intensity, maximal effort, um, that's not going to happen every day. And so we want to speak to the person that's okay with that. And that is prioritizing something a little different, um, in their, in their fitness journey, if that makes sense. So, so yeah, so it's, it's really, um, it's, it's a really cool practice and it is that it's such a practice Um, and I, I think it's a practice in the same way that coaching is a practice, um, and learning how to connect with different types of people, um, and to elicit the best results with different personalities, with different people from different, um, backgrounds and, you know, um, and different goals. Yeah, totally. Like the, the analogy to coaching there makes a lot of sense where it's like, okay, you have to sort of meet someone where they're at in terms of their, their understanding of the movement that you're trying to get them to do, you know, their level of frustration at how much you've already been coaching them or whether or not they're able to do the thing that they're doing. You know, they're, like you said before, their understanding of technical terms or lack thereof, like all that stuff sort of goes into a stew of like, okay, how do I actually speak to this person in a way that, you know, makes sense to them? Um, so, we talked about this a little bit, but you, you have a copywriting business. What's the deal with that? Yeah, well, I'm I'm sort of gearing gearing up to launch it, um, but it's so it's called Ethos Alchemy, um, and right now it's starting, you know, just simply as as copywriting, um, but hopefully will kind of evolve into a business that encompasses more aspects of of branding, especially. Um, but with Ethos Alchemy, this is kind of my attempt to like put some structure and like a name to what I kind of do, uh, on the fringes of my workday, you know, when it's not for strength ratio and I'm writing, you know, things like, um, you know, some web copy here or, or even like wedding ceremonies there. Um, I'm doing all this writing and, and it's sort of not under any particular, uh, umbrella. So ethos alchemy is kind of my answer to that. And, um, the idea is that um, I I would love to partner with individuals, organizations, and businesses that are uh, really dedicated towards 
um, enacting good in the world or like making positive change in the world. Um, and so the goal is to be able to provide kind of those written services to those organizations via this, this new, uh, this new business. Totally. And if people are interested in any of that stuff or any of the strength ratio stuff, where should they go? Where would you point them? Yeah. Um, so for ethos alchemy, um, you can just go to ethos alchemy.co.co. Um, and if you're interested in strength ratio, um, you can go to strengthratiohq.com. And strength ratio is not just a gym in a place, but also does remote coaching, correct? Yes. Yeah. Strength ratio does um, completely individualized remote coaching, um, but also um, we have some uh, like templated programs as well. So there's kind of the more like uh, pre-written programs and then there's the like premium kind of completely customized experience. There we go. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and of course, you know, you can follow strength ratio on Instagram as well. Um, it's another great place to get info. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, the best thing to do would be to send it to one of your friends who also likes podcasts. If you want more, I have an email list where I send out a weekly update with all the podcasts I've recorded and articles that I've written. I also include my favorite things that I've been reading or listening to as well. You can sign up for that at www.toddneve.com. That's I before E. Or you can open up the show notes in your podcast player and click the link in there.